Hello, I'm Rosalind Ash of Dear Reader Blog. Welcome to our Crime Scene Podcast. Today I'm in conversation with two men from very different walks of life who have forged an unlikely friendship from inauspicious beginnings. Graham Bartlett served as a police officer for 30 years, rising to the rank of Commander of Brighton and Hove. Graham is now an advisor to crime fiction writers on police procedural and is also a successful crime writer himself. David Henty, who describes himself as an art forger, is a remarkably gifted artist who went to prison for forging passports many years ago, but has since carved out a highly successful career painting commissioned copies of famous artworks under his own name. We met up in David's lovely home, which is stacked to the gunnels with paintings and artist paraphernalia, to talk about Graham and David's shared history and unlikely friendship. I started by asking Graham to tell us something about his background. What I wanted to talk to you about was your, what seems on the surface, an unlikely friendship. <laughs> We're the odd couple, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are. So I just wanted to talk to you both, start at the beginning in a way, and talk about your backgrounds first. So I'll start with you, Graham, if okay. I may. Maybe you could just fill in a little bit of background. Yeah, so I, I'm, um, I, I was a police officer for 30 years. Um, predominantly in Brighton and Hove, and, and mainly as a detective. So I've done a lot of the, most of the roles that a detective would do, but um, the majority of it was, was kind of working um, what we call kind of um, sort of medium level crime in, in, in Brighton. And Brighton's a, a, a fabulous city for that because there's so, there's so much variety of crime, you know, there's so much opportunity, there's money to be made, there's some big characters, um, uh, there's violence as well, and there's some real nastiness. But it was it was there was never a dull day. So my my background was was that, and then when I retired from the police, uh, amongst other things, I became an author, and I'm, I'm now an author. So I've written two non fictions: Death Comes Knocking and Babes in the Wood. And uh, my um, I've written a three book series. The third one's due due out very soon, um, called uh, Bad for Good, Force of Hate, and um, City on Fire. So now I'm an author and I advise other writers as well. But David and I have been friends for probably yeah. a long time. <laughs> long time, yeah. yeah. So, only, yeah, yeah since huge. I left the police. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and I wanted to ask you as well, you just mentioned about Brighton. From your point of view as a police officer, you said it's a fabulous place because of the yeah. variety of crime, which strikes me as quite amusing, really. Um, but it's also, it's, it's got quite a mixed reputation, Brighton, as a city, hasn't it? So it's got all the glamour, and it's had that from since the Prince Regent onwards. Mm. Glamorous mm. people coming here, like Laurence Olivier on the Brighton Bell, and yeah. Betty Davis and Cary Grant, and it's full of creatives and glamorous people. Mm. But there's that dark side, and I just wondered if were you aware of that seedy side when you were growing up, and did that interest you? Is that what what made you want to go into the police? Um, I, yeah, I, I was aware of it. I, I, not not in, in as much detail as I would become aware of it, but um, I lived along the coast in a place called Shoreham, uh, and my dad was from Brighton, and, and my dad uh, worked for the council. He was the borough surveyor for the council, and he loved the city. He, he, he was kind of born and bred. Um, so he used to talk to me about, you know, the knocker boys and the antiques and, you know, ju- just out of kind of interest in folklore and folklore and... I remember reading Brighton Rock at quite a young age and reading all about the Razor Gangs at the at the, at the Race Hill. So I knew I, I knew that Brighton had an edge to it, and and it, it's a kind of you're right when you say, you know, that there there is the, the these extremes because it is very glamorous, and you know it, it was created because of the, the seawater, and everyone thought the seawater had healing properties, and Prince Regent built you know the huge Royal Pavilion, which still stands today, and. And, you know, it became a city of decadence um, and with that came wealth. But there is always an undercurrent of uh, in a city like Brighton. And now it's it's seedier than it was. It's it's kind of a, you know, it's drugs, organised crime. There's a lot more nastiness than there was before. When I was a detective, it was more the sort of traditional, the traditional kind of entrepreneur criminal, I would call it, you know, people that, wanted to make make money, wanted to, you know, weren't kind of that worried about, you know, paying the taxes or, 
uh, and it was a kind of game really you know between us and and them you know if they got caught that was you know that that was a you know that that was a risk they took and and there was never there was never a kind of a hatred between the police and and that element of the of, of the criminal fraternity of Brighton and Hove. That feels quite old fashioned now, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, and and I I think you probably struggle to find it because I think people have got greedier. I think crimes become more. Um, well, nastier, I think. Oh, you know. Have drugs oh, done no, that? I think drug, <clears throat> drugs have done that. I think, yeah. you know, the, the the internet isn't evil, but people do evil things on the internet. Um, and, you know, and I think, I think the, you know, that online crime and exploitation, you know, that obviously that wasn't around back in the early 90s when, when I was kind of working as a, as a street detective in Brighton. So, I think, sorry, well, I think there's a lot more street... Uh, street family orientated as well mm. because there were large families in yeah. the council estates yeah. and a lot of the crime were, you know, the things we did, knocker boys, antiques, uh, that was a career you went into when mm. you were a big family and uh, so I think that's all changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that, that's really true and, you, you know, we were talking earlier and we were just, you're talking about, you know, names of families, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, that family oh, and that family, family and that exactly. family and, and yeah. it's like, yeah, they used to, they used to run the, you know, run the crime. Yeah. Uh, you, as a criminal, sorry, mm. but as a criminal, I could phone up, you know, one of these people, one of these families, so if I had a bent antique or, you know, a stolen car or traveller's checks or whatever it was at the time, there was families for different, you know, old people because it was a network. Mm. Well, you know, different skills that they could help. Yeah, yeah, you know, so yeah. you phone Shady Dave up for a, for a car <laughs> and sure, we were making yeah, 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 yeah. You know, or, or someone else. So it was, you know, that's all changed now. It's not like that now. No, you know, no, is, no. Is, I think mainly, I don't, I don't know now, but I think mainly it's drugs now. It's quite a dirty sort of business. Yeah, drugs, people trafficking, all that. <coughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the nastiness of it. But yeah, it was, it was I mean, uh, in Death Comes Knocking, I, uh, the chapter I write about it is called Bad Business because mm. it was, it, you know, these, family, these families were, were, were business, businessmen. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they were running businesses. Yeah. Yeah. The problem was the business was against the law, um, and they yeah. weren't paying taxes. But you know, other than that, they were entrepreneurs, and they were very clever entrepreneurs. They would move with trends very quickly, yeah. you know. And yeah. but it's still of... a very entrepreneurial place, Brighton, isn't yeah. it? You know, a lot mm. of new independent small businesses grow up here, yeah. don't mm. they? But legitimate ones, I'm thinking of. Mm. But obviously, yeah. it was... Well, one of my one of my takes when I was in prison, when I got five years <laughs> for the passports of Graham. Yeah. Nick me on. <laughs> we'll talk about um, that. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, um, no, but it changed my life. Yeah. But um, what happened was I went into the art department and stuff. I went to write. I was writing, first of all, in um, with Steve Place mm. in Lewis. <clears throat> um, he was a resident uh, writer there. Mm -hmm. And I was doing stuff with him. And then I went to another prison and I, I went to the art department. And I rediscovered painting. But the, well, I, it's not about me, but I want to say it was the talent that was in there. Mm. It was unbelievable. Yeah. You know, the, there was guys in there that were, you know, knock me for six with their talent, painting, sculpting, doing all sorts of stuff. But they, they didn't, have, I don't think they had a way to um, express it outside. Mm. So oh. what happened? You do what you know. Yeah, yeah, you know? what you've been brought up to. That's yeah. what I wanted to ask you about, David. Mm. If you could talk a bit about your history as Graham did as well and what well, you know, where, to where you grew up and <laughs> <laughs> your family and all of that you know what were your influences and <clears throat> well, you were obviously very talented artistically when you well, were young so yeah we could all I never thought anything of it because I thought everyone could do it everyone could draw and paint I, I was doing um Hogarth drawings at eight and my dad gave me a book he probably probably nicked it <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, never, never returned it from the library, but, but I, I had uh, meningitis, I think, so I was in bed for a bed bound for a while. And uh, so he brought this book up and it had all the Hogarth uh, old uh, things Lane of London. And all that, yeah. yeah, yeah, Jim Lane. Yeah. Just, and I had pencil and pad and I used to draw them out. And my way of brain was working was that, uh, you know, if there was, a, there was an arm there and a finger there, then something else comes down. I could work it out like a puzzle. And I used to draw it, and eight years old, I was, you know, amusing myself so I never thought anything of it mm. um, and we're all artistic but we had we didn't you couldn't express it could you you know yeah. uh, my brother Steve they wanted to send him to a special school he was doing their Michelangelo drawings at, um, about 10 or 12 but being the uh, the second oldest of uh, five brothers 
who all did boxing and karate and judo. Yeah, if it had done that, you know, we'd have all took the mickey. So you you, you went on the career that you know that everyone else did, that family did. And my dad was a um, you know dodgy, um, <clears throat> he was a dodgy car dealer, an antique dealer, and uh, he got he got three and a half years for forged MOTs, um, <laughs> and then, you know, and then he went into the antique business. Um, so you followed in that footstep because that's what the families mm. knew, you know. And uh, did you think you were you going to go into the antiques business? I did. Or? Yeah, I did go yeah. into that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not still very good at antiques. I still uh, collect antiques actually. Mm -hmm. I've got a few um, straight ones. Straight. <laughs> <laughs> he always looks at me. I know people can't see this, but he always looks at me when he, when he says that as if I'm, I'm not in the police anymore. <laughs> you know, there's always this, you can never lose that aura. <laughs> but, no, it's, uh, but no, you know, I collect antiques, but just because I like them. Um, I collect watches and things like that, and old pocket watches. Um, but yeah, I think that's part of my heritage, you know, because that's what we. Well, I used to nick them, you know, or would handle, you know, a stolen one. Um, you know, now I wouldn't dream of it. You know, now I know the other side of it. And, you know, I've talked to people who have had their houses, uh, would all, you know, lost stuff. You know, I understand it now, but at that age, you don't. And you don't. <clears throat> having a, a father was quite strong, a really strong person. All I wanted to do was please him. And, uh, you know, and the way to please him was to make money. And, uh, you know, you know, at 15, I was out doing stuff that I shouldn't have been doing, and, and he was buying anything that I got, you know. And uh, so, yeah, it's a little bit difficult in that respect. I, don't, I mean, I think that's really interesting, though, because whichever side of the law you look at, in, you know, in that generation, in, you know, David and my generation, you did tend to follow what you, you know, the yeah, family yeah. traditions. Yeah. And, and, you know, difference and creativity wasn't valued as much and wasn't, yeah. certainly wasn't yeah. nurtured, you know. Yeah, you, yeah. You know, I mean, my, you know, I'm, I'm not from a, I'm not from a police family per se, but my uncle was in the police. My dad was a, was a volunteer police officer, a special police, and I, I was very interested in the police. Um, you know, if I said I wanted to go off and, you know, be a ballet dancer or learn sculpture yeah. or something like that, I'd, they'd, have, they'd have looked at me like yeah. I've gone mad yeah. because it's just a generational thing. Yeah, so yeah. I don't think it's, you know, I think the fact that you know David's followed. Followed basically the family business, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I followed the kind of you know almost the family business as well. And so many, so many people do in the police. You know, you so they you can trace it's their like generations mm -hmm. right back. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's that much difference. I think it's just you know what, yeah. what that family business happened to be. To be, yeah. yes. I don't know if it's the same with you, Graham, but you I always had this creative streak. <clears throat> so did my sister. So did um, my brothers. Two of my brothers are painters, and mm -hmm. um, one of them. Uh, buys and sells on watches like um, my sister Shane has got books out. So I always had this creative streak with I wanted to write or um, paint or do stuff, but you couldn't because of the family, um, you know, the, the dynamics. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. because uh, they'd look at you and go, well, What are you doing that for? You know, What's my dad would say, Well, what are you yeah. wasting your time? Mm. You know, especially back then, as Graham says, yeah, it has yeah. changed a bit, hasn't it? I think mm, it's yeah. quite hard for boys and young men to yeah. to show any softer side or creativity. Mm, yeah, You're supposed to be tough, aren't you? Mm. Get out there and do and yeah. whatever yeah. they want you to do. We grew up in Morscombe, which was, uh, as you all know, was a pretty rough. Mm. I think at the time we were growing up, it was one of the roughest estates in the in the mm -hmm. in the land. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. It was tricky. <clears place. throat> do you know, and you had to be able to take care of yourself and fight. And I went to Morscombe and Stammer. Um, and it changed at the West Lane when I was there, but you know it was they were rough, rough, rough times. And uh, it, you know, if you, I said, "Oh, I want to be an artist," mm. <laughs> you know, but they'd have looked at me like I just landed from yeah. another planet. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But, so you, you were going out as a youngster doing things you shouldn't do. You said, yeah, um, yeah. and eventually you got into this sort of forging racket with the. Yeah. The passports and cassettes, and with your friend Cliff, Cliff was just fine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So tell us a bit about that, and then Graham can give his side of that story. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was quite funny because there is some other aspects to it. I mean, I never got arrested, but you know, we were printing money. We were trying yeah, to get yeah, money, yeah. and Barry yeah. and Cliff and I got arrested for it. Um, I never did, but I worked out how to do the walk marks and the security on the on the money. But while we we got bail, um, so we were on bail for about nearly two years, twenty mm -hmm. months, I think. Yeah. 
We weren't slow in those days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we, I had a house in um, Wycombe Terrace, number one Wycombe Terrace in the clock tower, a big old gothic house. And I used to, um, we used to go to clandestine meetings. And I remember seeing um, the police, you know, they'd be in the graveyard, you know, <laughs> watching who you'd meet you with and stuff. And, uh, so you knew you were being watched. Yeah. Well, one day it was, it was so funny. I'll get back to the passports, but um, what was your mate's name? Um, the one who died, he, he came and got me from Spain. Um, he's, he was a really nice guy. I can't somebody he lived, he lived, up, he lived up the road, um, Brian Ball. Oh, Brian Ball, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was yeah. a nice fella. But anyway, he... Um, good electrician so, he was. Yeah, was he? <laughs> it was very good electrician. But there was no bad feeling. We used to see him in the car, and we, we in the traffic or something, and do you want to go on holiday, you know, and we'd sort of like try and drive him, yeah. like muck him about, yeah. and he'd say something back to us, you know, and so it was all fun. Mm. <clears throat> but one day, um, I had a clandestine meeting, so I walked past someone in the graveyard, and they gave me the the um, the prototype of the 50 pound note, I think it was at the time, 50s and 20s. So I sort of like you know, to put him in my jacket because I knew we were being watched. <laughs> but I went to my door, the Wycombe Terrace, and uh, <laughs> And just as I got in, the door opened, uh, banged like that. I opened the door and Brian Bourne was there. <laughs> and I to, honestly, I need to thank <laughs> I had this, I had this money, this prototype um, towards money in my pocket. And uh, so I looked at him and I must have been white. And I said, what, what do you want? <laughs> he said, oh, I've just come to give you some stuff back. <laughs> oh, really? And they raided yeah. my house. Yeah. And, uh, gave me stuff. <laughs> and I was like, that's <laughs> why I've got grey hair. <laughs> <laughs> but this uh, it was a funny time. It was like cops yeah. and robbers. Yeah, it? well, no, it was. It, it, it was, and um, you know, people like Brian. You mentioned Brian. Brian was a, a, a detective constable in, in the same office as I was. He, and he was, you know, he, he was like a human kind of information database about yeah. everybody, knew everybody. <laughs> but the problem was, he could he, he could barely drive into work without arresting someone. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> no, he'd spot someone that was wanted. Some people had that knack. I never had it. Yeah. Did yeah. he have that facial recognition thing as well? Well, I think he probably did, yeah. yeah. But he also knew the ball, and yeah. um, you know, as you said, yeah, he, he lived up the road. Yeah, he lived he up, lived, yeah. A couple of streets yeah. away, and yeah. uh, I used to, um, when I got out of um, uh, prison, um, I bought myself a Mercedes sports car, and I went to America, and I had a hat with FBI, FBI on it, <laughs> and, and I used to wear it, and like, always bib it, and say, oh, Brian. <laughs> 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 and the hat and stuff and we used to laugh about it he, you know he, and he pulled me to the side one day and he said oh you know don't ever tell any of your friends where i live and i said oh, i wouldn't do that you know because mm. i liked him he yeah. was um he was you know he's fair to me mm. yeah and, nice. and one thing we did one day because i went on the run and um, when i was for the passports the day before the, the trial I, I went off and um, because we're on a conspiracy but shady shady dave was my coach conspirator <laughs> He didn't have much evidence on him. Mm. So we knew that if he got not guilty, then I couldn't be charged with conspiracy. Mm. So um, there's a law of disparity or something. So I went off on the run and uh, <coughs> I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was it. And so they, Brian was looking for me and then the police were looking for me and stuff like that. And I was down in the south of France with a friend of mine. And uh, so, anyway, so I went in this booth and Cliff had to go back. Uh, for something else, back to, on on uh, bail, answer his bail. So for the money, this one. So anyway, so uh, so I was down the south of France, and there was this booth there, and and in the back of the booth, you could press um, different settings. So one was like Hawaii, and uh, so I pressed the back of the. It was like a photograph booth. Mm. So I pressed the Hawaii there, and I had a diamond uh, cartel at the time, because you know we were we were earning a lot of money. So 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 I did this, you know, the one finger with the cartel. With his background, the Hawaiian, and we took a photograph. Cliff put it in his pocket. So when Cliff went and answered his bail, Brian arrested him, got him in, and pulled the <laughs> pulled the photograph out. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you know, just to take it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it wasn't a um, thing. It was a funny, you know. So we yeah. were laughing about it. You know, we didn't laugh, and we got caught, obviously. But no, but yeah. And you were still hatching schemes, weren't you, when you were in prison? I think. Graham, you described that in the book, Death Comes Up, mm. it? even when you were in there for your passport yeah. thing. Yeah. You and your mate Cliff were hatching new schemes. We were, because, you know, we didn't, um, we didn't like to turn our attention to anything else, really. Mm. So you do what you what you're used you've to got definitely. flair for. Yeah. You know, we, we had a, I mean, Cliff, as you mentioned earlier, thinks out the box. Mm. So he came up with some good schemes, you know, good ideas. 
So we'd be sitting there and we'd be brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd be sitting in our cell at night and you've got nothing, you didn't have a TV then. So you'd be sitting there saying, well, I've got an idea. You know, and then we'd go through the ins and outs, whether it work or not, and you know, mm -hmm. what we'd have to do and all that sort of stuff. So, so like Graham was saying earlier, someone like that's really bright, got unusual ideas, thinks mm -hmm. differently. They're just yeah. they're directing it yeah, yeah. in a criminal direction, yeah. but could have, with other circumstances, could have been a successful businessman or... Yeah, no, and, and that, that was the point that I made in the book, that, you know, those conversations, those cell yeah. conversations you told me about, mm -hmm. they were... They were kind of two two businessmen really mm. that saying, okay, well that didn't work. What what's mm. next? Mm. You know, what's our next move? What's our mm. what's our you know our business strategy now? And it, mm. you know, without using mm. those terms, that that's what it was like. And you can imagine, you know, directors of huge organisations having mm. similar conversations about you exactly. know their their business. Exactly. Mm. Well, we um <laughs> we. Well, I don't know if I should say it. <laughs> but, but when, when, um, when I was on bail uh, for the passports, I was driving a, a red BMW. And obviously I was flagged by the police and stuff like that. But I bought the car off from my brother, who's a car dealer at the time. We hit sprayed the bonnet. And for some reason, it, it was lacking a VIN plate. So it didn't have a VIN. So anyway, the police pulled me by the side, the traffic police. And... They didn't like me, I didn't like them. It was someone that um, I disliked, so I don't know who it was, but we mm. didn't, didn't get on. <clears throat> so anyway, so he, the car had Southern Irish number plates on. So, so anyway, he was, um, you know, looking at me and he was saying, to, I heard him say to his mate, you know, there's no VIN plate there, they're checking the car over. So they thought the car was stolen. And I was going to say, I bought it from my brother, just in case it was. Mm. You know, so I wasn't going to. So anyway, so um, I heard him phone up his PNC check. So he phoned up on his radio, the PNC check, and it came back. And this is uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Oh, and the rest, yeah. Yeah, and um, it came back. Um, we can't do a PNC check with Southern Ireland because we've got no, uh, we, we just don't speak to them. So he had to come back, and uh, he was really angry, and he had to let me drive off. And he actually thought I'd nicked the car. Mm. And uh, so, funny, so, so when we were in the, the prison, <laughs> um, it was, you know, Let's phone up my mate, um, John Trainer, in Ireland. I said, you got any logbooks over there? He said, yeah, yeah, come send some over to get one. So I sent my mate over on a plane. He, he got the uh, the green Irish logbook. Mm. So anyway, so, so that, that we got one back. So I had a friend of mine who was a printer. So we printed them up and they were on card. So, because uh, <laughs> this is how, how you think. This is, you know, the, the way your mind worked. So anyway, so we, we need to car. <laughs> that night, it happened to belong to a nun we didn't know till later on. <laughs> Up, um, you know, say it's common. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, there's nuns yeah, kind of yeah. 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 But anyway, <laughs> I'm sure she's forgiven me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so I got the got the car. I went and got a, a Southern Irish number plate, and I had the blank logbook. So I put the VIN number in there, put all the bits and pieces in there, and just put made up a Southern Irish number plate. Something, 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 D, and some numbers. I took it in the DVL down um, London Road. Mm. Do you remember it used to be down there? Yeah, yeah. The, the back of London Road. But yeah, Circus so House, whatever. Yeah, there. that's it. Really so I took it in there. I said, um, I've got my car over here, my Irish car, but I'm staying in there and I want to register it. And they said, yeah, okay. Um, and they gave me a, a number plate, straight, a, a taxi straight away, with a new number plate on it. They got it out of a book. And they said, you have the logbook in 14 days. So we were like, <laughs> we were like, the penny dropped. So anyway, I put the car through the auction because it's on the um, the mainframe now. The whether you phone up and mm. they PNC it, check yeah, it. Yeah, it's completely legal. As so they didn't check by the VIN number, they checked by the uh, chest, okay. uh, by the um, number plate. So that was it. So we um, I had a thousand logbooks. <laughs> so 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 being <laughs> and like you say, being families, mm. I knew someone. Well, I knew Shady, mm. but Shady knew someone in the docks in um, London. <clears throat> where all the cars come over, the brand new cars, and they get the cars um, and they nick them out the um, out the thing, and they're still in the wax. And they've got the keys, the right keys, and that one. Mm -hmm. And I was given three thousand pounds a time for these cars, registering, and they were uh, forty thousand. They were um, big um, uh, Toyota Land Cruisers, mm -hmm. and we were selling them, and they're, and, and they're completely legal. And we we went on for so long, I think eighteen months or two years. We ended up, um, we were driving Mercedes sports cars. 
I had jeeps to take my kids to horse riding. We even bought, me and Cliff bought a nightclub one night, just because we had all this money, we didn't know what to do with it, we bought a nightclub. <laughs> we, and, you know, but then eventually it came on top, because I think the police, Brian Former, thought I was a drug dealer, which I actually, yeah. we actually weren't. We were um, doing this, you know. But they come from, how, you, how you're saying, that brainstorm. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and a little incident with the yeah. police. Yeah. And, it seemed tricky, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we, when, when I, my, my, um, first sort of meeting with with Dave was was around the passports but it was actually so what happened with that was that we so I was there's different parts of of CID and and yeah. that you've got the intelligence side in Brighton we have the antiques unit and there's surveillance unit and very often and, and there's the the investigators and I was on the investigative side the investigative side and very often you don't know what the others are doing because mm. you, you don't need to know and it's kind of you know they need to keep it sort of very un so we didn't know there's there's been this big surveillance operation on Dave and Cliff and a few others um, that have been going on. And but we got called into a briefing one morning and told, right, the surveillance unit and the antiques unit have been watching um, David Henty, Cliff Wake, and, and a few others. Right, and we're going to execute some warrants this afternoon. Uh, but it was all to do with forging cassette tapes. Oh, was it? it was all to do with cassette tapes. We've been so, doing that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it yeah. was like they'd been forging cassette tapes and selling them up at the market. Yeah. Um, and we'd been watching them, following them. We got all the phone. Yeah, you know, it was a really good intelligence case. So it just so happened that there was like probably six or seven addresses that they wanted to search at the same time. And um, my, my sort of buddy, was what we used to work with, Dave Swainston and I, we were allocated. Yeah, yeah. We were allocated to. One Wickham Terrace, that, yeah. Dave's place. Yeah. Um, so, so we, so we kind of, you know, we sort of worked out the briefing and everything, how we were going to get in and everything. And we thought we were going to go in there and find evidence of counterfeit tapes and, you know, printing for for for, for the inlays for tapes, or cassette tapes, and yeah. and all that's what we were going to go in for. So we we kind of, you know, it's quite an easy place to sort of. Um, pounce on because there's like you know it's got a busy area yeah. around there and it's there's got no lots of people there. there's no way out Barry found a way out but <laughs> come on to that in a minute um so we just we, we went there and just kind of you know we, we bashed the door down and went in there expecting to find counterfeit taste mm. all of a sudden we're surrounded by the the smoking gun of a passport factory <laughs> in, in this and we're like <laughs> well, we weren't expecting this, <laughs> and there was there was baths with uh, with 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 all this kind of Rexine leather being I'm, dyed yeah. in it. I'm not the, the, not the thing because there was a bath. Did you see that? But we take the uh, the stamp off the um, the Frankie Mark with stamps. Oh right, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> but there was the, yeah there was cutting machines. Yeah. There was all this kind of templates and all this and um, industrial scale. Yeah, 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 and and. Um, I don't think Cliff was there, was he? But no, he walked up the road. Cliff, didn't he? Cliff walked up the road, and he, yeah. so he got arrested walking up the road. You were there, weren't you? Yeah, I was there. Yeah. And this this bloke called Barry. What's Barry's surname? Sherrington. Barry Sherrington. Yeah. yeah. He was the printer. He, he was the printer. Germany, yeah. He was the. Well, he had never even had a parking ticket. No. no. Until he moved next door to Cliff. Yeah. Cliff said, "What do you do?" He said, "I do printing." Yeah. And so he ended, job. Yeah, yeah. He ended up getting there. I got five years. He got five years. Oh. He also got another two years for the money, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah, yeah. But he was the one that decided to try and make a run for it. And he, he got got up onto the roof and tried to jump across this massive void um, between two buildings, tried yeah. to jump across, but but was he was no free jumper and he ended yeah. up he ended up really badly breaking his leg, didn't yeah, he? And he, yeah. he fell down to get I can't remember how I we got him out. It's there. a basement you can't get in there, can no. you? Not from my No, no, it's really difficult to get him out. Yeah. There was an agony down there. But, but then we photograph you in the yard, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Me coming, looking very young. Yeah, I've still got that. I think that's a <laughs> book actually. I put that in the books. It. I look so young in it. <laughs> Bring um, Barry on the then, we, then we went to Barry's Barry's house out at Peacehaven, and uh, where he was doing the printing with an old, um, massive orange frame screen printer. Screen print, yeah, 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 the old screen printer yeah. thing. And uh, do you know why we had that? Go on, because Dopey Barry, who did the spelling, not me. Yeah. What happened was um, on pages 30, 32 or 30 something, he forgot to put the spiral graph in the past. Ah, oh, that's right. So, yeah, we, yeah. so we had to do them by hand um, to, and then put them in the book. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. So we had to get a silk screen printer to do that. Yeah, 
Because yeah. they've been cut, we couldn't run them through the machine again. Yeah, that's it. So Bar Barry, Barry, unfortunately, couldn't spell very well. No. So the um, <laughs> well, it was Barry, wasn't Barry, it? Barry, Barry, the Chanik, the Chanik with one N, and yeah. Ma Majesty with a with a G, wasn't yeah. it? Or J, whichever way. <laughs> Everyone's forever right. blamed me, and they yeah. said, "Oh, you, know, oh, you can't spell, can you?" That's the word, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so that's where... Um, had any of them got through? I mean, had any of them gone out to their uh, customers? The funny thing was, Graham, um, in the kitchen, because <coughs> it was an old house, it was an old Regency house, in the kitchen, there was um, a big box of passports um, all layered um, behind, the, there was a cupboard, and then there's a wooden sort of backing. Behind this, there was a void, and there was a, I don't know how many, a thousand or three thousand, I can't remember, passports in there. Which after you search, they weren't there. And then when I was in, in on remand, someone I won't name them, but they got them and they took them and, my, and they said to my dad, What should we do? <coughs> dad said, Burn them. So, so they burnt them. And it was really hard to, to, to do um, like paper, you know, reefs of paper. So they burned them and anyway. And then, so when we got out on bail a few weeks later, I said, Right, we'll get them, we'll get them because we can sell them. Because they still want them, but then I had the fact that they were gone. They were, oh. Yeah, because uh, I think they were a thousand pound each at the time. Yeah. That's what you were going. Yeah. yeah. So and you that, never actually did sell any in the end. Is no. That right? I'm gutted that we missed them though. <laughs> yeah. I think it was somebody else's responsibility. I think it's Swanson's responsibility <laughs> to search the kitchen. Yeah. I was doing other floors. Yeah. <laughs> but it was funny. Do you know what? Because I had this house in the, in the middle of um, the Spire Churchill Square, uh, the clock tower in Churchill Square. But the bus looks into the, the windows there, you've got these big um, like three windows with wooden shutters. And when I bought these two painters off a guy and I put them on, I had two chimneys, it was a 40 foot um, lounge. So I had two chimneys. So I put these two lovely seascapes on the, um, on the hung, hung them over the fireplace. And I was like, oh, really pleased, you know, because I, I loved art and it's a fine cellar. Well, I was looking at Crime Watch as everyone does, you know, that all criminals watch Crime Watch. And, uh, <laughs> I look at them, these painters come up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a bus going by with the windows open. <laughs> it's, about, it's about six or seven o'clock at night, and uh, the lights are on. <laughs> so quickly close the shutters. You know. <laughs> um, how's your mate? Um, the one that went into art, um, a small fellow in the stosh, John. John Lipsham. Oh, John Lipsham. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've not seen John for a long, long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, because I know he went into art. Yeah, he? he did. Yeah. Because he was a, he was the um, on the art uh, squad, uh, well, I think he was he did stuff. But he was on the antiques and art. Yeah, yeah. But one day he raided my house. He's another time, and he come in and he took all the wrong pictures. He took oh, all the yeah. prints and sort of like <laughs> stuff that wasn't. And left all the other stuff, and I was like, <laughs> "Oh, they, yeah, he, that, that must be because he really prided himself in his, <laughs> his knowledge of art." Oh so. no! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> terrible. So, it, but you see, it was funny because I mean, I know John. I've had cups of teas with him. If I bump into him. We're going to have a chat, you know, and um, I haven't seen him for years, actually, but last time I did, he was doing art and stuff. And, yeah, um, I can imagine it, yeah. Yeah, you know, so we'd see him, when, and there was, you know, no animosity, animosity. we'd have a laugh that, you know, that he'd missed the paintings. So this isn't so unusual from what you two are saying, that this sort of friendly... Yeah, I think, that, yeah, that, there wasn't, because nothing was personal, you know, nothing was... We knew you know, it we, Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. you know, we, we would... You know, we, we, you know, because as Dave says, you've got these families. We knew, we yeah. knew the families. Yeah. And it was just yeah. a case of trying to catch them. And, and if we caught them, great. And if we didn't, well, they'll probably come another day or, you know, so it was this, it was this cat and mouse. But there was, the, yeah, it was never, it was never personal. And you could always laugh. You, know, you could always laugh and yeah. sit down and talk, talk to them. And mm. I mean, I tell you where it was a really good place to, to kind of just build and cement those relationships because they were important. You know, mm. so no, no one, certainly the police don't don't want to fight. They don't want any. They don't want to fall out with people at all. But the the fingerprint room used to be a really good place to get there because you yeah. you do the old fingerprints. They don't do them now. They do them all electronically. So it was a bit of an art to to um to take fingerprints properly. And you know you kind of we try and smudge them. Yeah, that's right. They kind of try and just just judder them on the paper. <laughs> Dave, you know, done it again. Gonna, yeah. But you could you know you because you're kind of. You're really up close and personal. Yeah, yeah. You're holding their fingers. You're yeah. rolling them on the ink and then rolling them on the yeah. paper. Hmm. You just get chatting, don't you? Yeah. And, and that's how that really broke down the barriers. And I'm not saying that was it all, but you, you kind of started to, to realise that actually we're not that different. 
Mm. You know, we're not that different. Do you remember, yeah. do you remember along um, Lewis Road, there used to be the shit hotel, which where they did the stripper on the Sunday. <laughs> I don't think you know that. No, 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 I never used to go there. But uh, next to it was um, a golf shop, massive big golf shop. Oh, yeah, Pringles. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And it had all the Pringles stuff. And anyway, one day, and, and it's just down the road from Moore School in Bevan Dean with the council estates. So, anyway, one day someone broke in there. Uh, the alarm never went off, or, or someone didn't answer the alarm or something like that. So, anyway, <laughs> well, the next day, the police were going around um, Wolfskin and Bevan Dean and Whitehawk, and everyone, I mean everyone, had bringle <laughs> jumpers. <laughs> they were dressed as golfers. They'd <laughs> 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 been that quick, you know, yeah. start nicking it, <laughs> send it out the back of the van. <laughs> Everyone, you know, we all had free. So let's get there again. See, very efficient distribution networks. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny? Yeah. yeah. What's what think Walmart yeah. would be proud of? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of phone calls and it's gone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but so you knew the families, so you already knew the Henty family. Mm. They were on yeah. your radar. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the antiques and, and the things David was up to. So you kind of knew him already, but you didn't get to know him, as you pointed out, until after. No, that's you right. Not, I'd not dealt with with. No. No, I don't think I. I probably no. I think I dealt with a couple of your brothers before, but I can't remember what it was all about. <laughs> but you know, you you just kind of you know you you pick the work that came through, and and we yeah we never did, but we you know we we kind of did the interviews, and you know we did the searches, and you know during that because it was a long time between yeah. between the arrest and the trial, so there's yeah. coming back on bail and that sort of thing. Well, I had a daughter. And we just got, sorry, I had a daughter. <laughs> In, in the you know in the, in the yeah. from bail to to mm -hmm. thing and yeah. she was uh, you know so I conceived and had yeah. her she was about eight months old nine months old so yeah so we we just got to know just got to know through that really and and I mean we didn't kind of have any contact after that did we really not until not until, until after I left the police that turned <laughs> off on your door. <laughs> I, um, so yeah. how did you get back in touch how did that happen so I I wanted to I wanted to write. Um, the story about the passports in Death Comes Knocking. Yeah. I, so Peter and I had agreed that we were going to collaborate in a non-fiction yeah. group, which became Death Comes Knocking. And I wanted to write this passport story. So I just think it's a fascinating story, and uh, you know, for the reasons that I've said. Um, and Dave Swainston, who was mm. the chap I worked with all the time when I was a DC, um, since he'd left the police, he he'd become a uh, what they call a, a, a police station representative. So he's not a lawyer, but he's, he goes to the police station, and um, yeah, and he he kind of he got to know you through that, yeah, didn't yeah. he? So I I contacted Dave and I said, you, you, you haven't got Dave Henty's details of you. I know, don't, don't tell me if it's a kind of breach of confidence. And he said, mm -hmm. well, I have. He said, I'll contact him and see whether mm -hmm. he's happy to to see you. So um, so we so did that, and then Dave, yeah. So we had a chat on the phone. Mm -hmm. and I said, oh, you know, I'm writing this book with Peter James, and. Uh, you know, wonder whether we could come and see you and talk about it. And I, to be honest, I thought you'd go, no, mate. You know, you, mm. you, you know, not, not, <laughs> not, not in this lifetime. <laughs> he said, yeah, 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 come along. He said, come along. Yeah, you could, we could go to the address, and which is where we're sat now. And um, so Peter, I said to Peter, right, we're going to go and meet this passport forger. And he goes, what? <laughs> which wasn't unusual because I did take him to Peter up to, to York to meet a triple murderer. <laughs> um, so I said it's not going to be as bad as that. He's right, he's right, he's right, he's right. He does. He's yeah. fascinating. Isn't he? So I said we're we're, we're going to make go meet this passport forger. I said he's, he's you know from what I can remember he's a lovely bloke you know be fine with us and but you know we'll we we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so anyway, so Peter's like he's going oh, okay, and so he's you know and, and sort of looking forward to it, but just thinking oh, how's it going to go. So knocked on the door. <laughs> and um, yeah. Dave answered the door and said, Graham, mate, how great to see you. <laughs> and it was like we were, you know, like I'd been best man at your wedding or something. We lost touch for a while. But I, I think, you know, when, when you go, they say when you, you go in the gym and you're boxing or, do, you know, you're sweating together and you're working together, mm. in some ways that's what it's like. It's mm. like, you know, mm. so, so you bond, mm. you know. Mm. It might not be, you know, you're on one side and I'm on the other, but still, you know, you, you know each other. I, I yeah. know about you, you know about me. Yeah. And we've we've had history. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So so I think in that respect you bond that you know, and we both evolved, we've got nice lives now. Yeah. yeah and, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. a forger. You've both changed. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
That's... You both changed direction, haven't you? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're now doing your legitimate forgeries, and you're a writer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is which is great. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was it was funny because I I invited Dave along to the book launch of Death Comes Knocking, and um, there I. I've mean, spoken to loads of people to write that book, loads mm. of ex-colleagues, mm. and a lot of them had had a lot closer dealings with Dave than I had back in the day. <laughs> One of them called Simon Muggleton, who's, oh, yeah. who's right himself. So, so Simon, Simon came along, yeah, he was on the Antique Squad, and he yeah. was quite serious, a really good detective, really solid detective, quite serious, serious chap. Me. So, um, but he knew you very yeah, well. He knew you very well. So, um, I didn't tell Simon that I was invited. I did. I told yeah. Dave that I was going to, you know, there'd be lots of, he only knew anyway, there'd be lots of, yeah, there's a few. So, that's right with that. And um, so, Simon was there for, not first, but he was there before Dave. And he was like chatting away. And then Dave walked in. So I was talking to Simon. He's just like, <laughs> face dropped. And he like looked to the side. <laughs> And he could see, and then he could see Dave coming because he's coming in with his big smiley face. And <laughs> I think Natanya was with you, and just like, and he's like, he said to me, he said, "Great, you know, David Hentges here." I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I invited him. <laughs> well, well, you could have told me. I said, "Well, what do you want me to do? Run the guest list past you?" Said, no, but you could have told me. I said, "Yeah, but it's all right, isn't it? You'll be okay." <laughs> Anyway, there was there was a fair amount of free wine at this do, and, but within about half an hour they were chatting like old yeah. friends. And I've actually got my my wife uh, made a canvas of photos from that from that book, yeah. my first book I've written. And there's a picture of of Dave with my two sons under each arm. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were they must have been how old were they? They, they, they were quite been, young. They? they would be yeah, about eighteen, nineteen, yeah. something like yeah. that. And that is on this canvas. So every time I walk to my kitchen, I see Dave with my two boys. <laughs> but do you know the funny thing was, um, if that night, which was a great night, wasn't it? Mm, it was mm. a really busy. Right in town hall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was um, a guy came up to me, and he was um, the passport controller, or pass something to do with passports. Oh, yeah. In the great, yeah, yeah. And he, I don't know if he, something about the Black Museum or the, in Scotland Yard. No, the police museum there. It was oh, was it? The police yeah. museum there, yeah. Because he was asking me all sorts of questions. You know, well, how did you do this? And how would you? And if you had to do the, um, you know, the new passport, how would you go about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and obviously, from a forger's point of view, um, you know, if you if you do it like you've got plastic money now and you've got different mm. things, then we look at how to do it. You know, how how would we go about it? <laughs> and there's always ways mm. to uh, to do it. You know. <clears throat> so, so I said to him, oh, I can't reveal my secrets. No. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. but I, I, so about a little while after that, I, I came around here again, because I, I was writing my second book, Babes in the Wood, which was based in Moleskine, or a lot of it was based in Moleskine, so I just want to talk to Dave about Moleskine. And um, we were sat out on um, on the deck, it was a nice day, I wasn't sat on the mm. deck, in, and the um, doorbell rang. It was just Dave and I, I was like, oh, it's, 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 I don't know who that is, I was going... <laughs> Go and answer the door. So he went and answered the door. He came back and he was like doubled up with like apps. And I said, "What's the matter? What's the matter?" He says, "You would not believe what I've just taken delivery of." Show, got this envelope. Took his new passport out. Of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a real one. A real one. Yeah, real one. Yeah, real one. Yeah, all the days, all the time that could be delivered. It's like, like coming yeah, back to haunt me. <laughs> Thank you for listening to part one of this two-part interview with Graham Bartlett and David Henty. Look out for part two coming soon.